What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. On today's episode, episode I'm joined by Paul Musoff. We're going to have a good chat. I know this guy a little bit. I've been paying attention to what he does, but we'll get a chance to go a lot deeper, and, and of course, so will you in the process. If you're new to what we do here at Martial Arts Radio, please head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out every episode we've ever done. This is, I, I don't know exactly what number this is going to be, but 9 30 40 something we've been around a while so uh you've got some material you can go check out if you happen to be new if you want to support us and all the things that we do to connect edu- connect educate and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world visit whistlekick.com paul thanks for being here man thanks for the time thank you thanks yeah. for having me yeah all right how are you doing today? i am doing well uh it, it's it's going to be another hot day but fortunately you're we're talking in the morning, so got all the windows shut. The cold air's cold. <laughs> cold is relative, right? Air is still inside, so I'm 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 kind of right. comfortable. How about you? What's going on on your end? Oh yeah, uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm well. I, when I get done with this, I got to go do window installation because that's my day job, <laughs> and then uh, after that, go teach karate. Nice. Well, so well, uh, at least two of those three things sound good. Talking to me sounds good. Yeah. Teaching karate well, sounds good. Windows, I don't know about the windows. What's the weather going to be today? Well, uh, 82, oh, that's I not, think, is that's the not high bad, right? Michigan. No, but it did say there are possible thunderstorms, so that'll yeah, be something. So good. Anyway, not, not anybody cares about thunderstorms in Michigan. But <laughs> What's the biggest window you've ever installed? Uh, well, I do. Um, right now, I'm doing windshields uh, oh, okay. in cars. And the biggest one was on a conversion van that uh, they actually used to uh, deliver windshields. So it was it was just it was massive, as big as a desk. So I would be really cool. nervous about breaking those. I yeah. broke a couple. Uh, so yeah, so one of the things you can do when you're installing windows is you can there's a urethane bead that goes mm-hmm. around the window and you tap on it, right? Well, uh, I've been doing the coconut <laughs> training stuff, so iron palm. <laughs> And so my boss is like, yeah, okay, tap on it. So I tapped on it he broke. and uh, I broke it. Yeah. He's like, not that hard. I'm like, I barely tapped it. So what, right. what I'm, what I'm hearing so, is your karate training is so rugged that you just, you're shattering windshields without intent. That's yeah. Yeah. My wife said not to, she said, go easy. You're like, you're 10% is like everybody else is 50%. Knock it off. I feel like there's some, I don't know, like. Right. Superman Hulk sort of joke in there. Maybe we'll find it later. But that's yeah. If, if anybody's watching and they can write one, that's, yeah, that'd be yeah, great. That's impressive. I, I I don't think I've ever had anything like that happen. So good on you. No, well, I didn't expect it really. Um, I looked. I did look it up though. That since we're talking about that, uh, the psi, the pounds per square inch to break a windshield is anywhere between sixty and ninety okay. psi, which is not that yeah. bad, right? So, but when you think about like a pine board, a one inch pine board is 250 PSI. So if you can break a one inch inch pine board, a windshield shouldn't be that hard. Mm, Makes sense. I mean, it's it's just two pieces of glass with a piece of laminate Mm -hmm. in the middle of it to keep it from shattering. But (laughs) anyway. um, Which have you been doing longer? Yeah, I'll be messing with that. Windows or or karate? Which have you been doing longer? Oh, I've only been doing windows be... Got it. Windows about a year, oh, okay. actually. Before that, I was a special education teacher in Flint. Why the, that? That is, that's about as big a shift. I, I can't even get there from one to the other. It's a long okay. story, but we, I guess we, we got have time. time. <laughs> we we to, have time. We, and and here, okay. here's why. Okay, here's why so, I want to know. Teaching, right? Because you talked about teaching karate as being something you love doing. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. And so there, I, I know plenty of martial arts instructors who are teachers in other ways in their day job, but they usually continue doing that. And if they shift out, it's not usually to something that's so 180 like windshields, windows. Yeah. Well, it, one, it was the, the job I'm working at is right across the street okay. from the dojo. So it's all I got to do is I take three steps. So logistically, here, it's, right? it's a the other part upside. was. Uh, Oh, it's wonderful. It saves on yeah. gas. It's fantastic. But the the reason I switched from working in a public school system to doing windshields um, was um, a lot of things. 
the first two years, uh, I worked from K through six, which was good. I liked working with the little kids, and it actually got me a lot of experience working with kids. Uh, in the dojo, we don't really – we're not a traditional school that, that just teaches mm -hmm. kids. You know how, like, uh, normally you get in – the average story is – you're a kid yourself, your parents put you through the martial arts, you have some aptitude for it. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you stick right. with it. You stick with it long enough to earn your black belt. You know, you, you stick around long enough. Maybe maybe you go to the tournament circuit. Maybe you just uh, train in the dojo, however that path works for you. Then you go and um, you earn your second degree black belt. You become an instructor and, you know, um, all things line up and then you own your mm -hmm. own school, right? Let's, let's say that happens. Okay, that's cool. Um, when you own your own school, you do that same process. You teach kids, they grow up, and they go and do martial arts as adults. Okay. I, I didn't do any of that. I started when I was 26 years old. Right? Yeah. So it was non, a non-traditional yeah. start for me. And so my, my uh, delve into martial arts wasn't a kid thing. Like I had no understanding of how to teach kids uh, that martial arts was for kids or could be for kids, that there was two types of martial arts children's of martial arts and adults martial arts i didn't know that because we did my teacher the uh founder of this school hand karate do he didn't really teach kids under mm -hmm. 13 right and then i couldn't make it till classes until 6 30 and then it was the adult class adult adult class anyway so i didn't even you know so anyway that didn't whole, sure, no, whole sure. other thing but if you grow up with the kid if you grow up with the kid mindset or martial arts can be for kids it's a little easier to mm -hmm. hop into training kids Right. And having that be a thing. OK. So but it really it vamped up my thought process on how to teach kids, because I, I really liked working with the kindergarten kids and uh, all the way up to sixth grade. It, public education is interesting to see how a young mind grows and learns and works. Right? It's really. In, and the way the teachers, the teachers I worked uh, with my first two years were fantastic, wonderful people that the, all they wanted to do was watch these kids grow. And. I, I fell in love with that part of it because I was already a teacher uh, in the dojo. So it was easy to go into that because we, as teachers, we, we love to see our students go from zero to, you know, whatever their goal is, you know, and, it, and it's wonderful. The light bulb moments and the growth, it, it's something to be really proud mm -hmm. of, you know, for sure. not from a teacher's point because I, I, I led them to that point, but because they were, they had the grit and the determination to get there, you know. So I so I I liked that. I said I'm I'm gonna go be a teacher. I was a I was a paraprofessional. Yep. If you're familiar with that, it's somebody that helps out in the classroom. Okay. Well, the first year, uh, I was a parapro in a in a school in mm -hmm. Flint, and there it was just before COVID, and they they put me in the parapro position, and they they had three teachers mm -hmm. quit, and one was in a second grade class, and they said, well, what we can do. Uh, is put you in a temporary long-term sub position so you can help this classroom out because their, their teacher left. And I said, well, I'm, I'd really be willing to do that because I was already working with that classroom mm -hmm. two weeks prior. And the teacher, it was, it was pretty nuts, uh, Jeremy. I mean, the, te the, the kids were extremely rambunctious. You're choosing your words they, carefully. I, I mean, hear. it was, like, <laughs> yes, they were, well, they were, there were instances of chairs going from one end of the room to the other um, in second second grade, wow. pushing each other down. One kid lost the tooth. It was crazy. So, I mean, it was it was a lot. That is yeah. a lot. So I said, okay, fine. We'll, at least they're going to have some sense of stability because I'm mm -hmm. not going to leave. Right? I'll, I'll at least work the year with them. And I did that until I, from September to December. I was the long-term sub in that classroom and I actually made some headway. They, they stopped being ridiculous and... Uh, at least for the most part, there was still, it's hard to control kids that are still learning to, you know, you, you, it's very important that you have a skill set. Like I was good at classroom management. Yeah, that's what dojo. I was thinking that, that but, coming in with, with some of those skills. But to get it to transfer into a classroom setting was, mm -hmm. it was a bit of a challenge, but we made it work until, until almost January. We made it till just after Christmas and then they had an actual teacher mm -hmm. come in. So I, I, I did my part. And then I worked in a third grade classroom with uh, a gentleman named Billy Tier, wonderful teacher. Um, he taught me a lot about how uh, the education system works. Anyway, I got I got my feet wet those first two years, that first year. And then mm -hmm. COVID happened, and then we learned how to teach virtually, and that was a whole other thing. 
uh, they, and they saw how I worked in the classroom. So uh, they gave me the history portion to teach, which was really cool because uh, we were teaching yeah. online. So, and I like, like history. Most martial artists so do. that was a whole thing. And then when we kind of yeah. like history. Yeah. Most martial artists, at yeah. least well, that's in my, in my experience, yeah. maybe it's, maybe it's, you know, it's the exposure I have here with this show, but most of the people I talk to find some enjoyment in, in how things used to be. But please continue. Yeah. Well, yeah. And the, well, you've got to know where you came from sure. to know where you're going. Right. So, and that's the same thing we do here when we go and we delve into Kata or we delve into some of the traditions and some of them are traditions for tradition's yeah. sake. Some of them are traditions for cleanliness, you know, like, uh, why, why is our, why are our gi white? Right. So that we, we know that we're wearing mm -hmm. clean clothes, stuff like that. And our belt's not supposed to touch the floor because the karate spirits will dissipate. It's because you don't want to get the germs off the floor. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I did my two years there and then some roles changed in that school system. And then I went to a mm -hmm. different school in Flint and they had, found, uh, I, I had, it's funny. I applied for their para pro position in the English okay. section because that's what the last thing I did at the other school. And they said, well, actually, you did so good at the um, interview for the para pro. We have a position that we might be interested in. Uh, it's special education. It's the uh, you'll be working with a co-teacher, but you'll you'll have control of the classroom. Um, you'll be teaching a class in a classroom since you've already had that experience. We think we can do that. And I'm like, cool. well, that's irregular. But OK. Uh, and it was it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I loved working that first year at that school. I got to work uh, high school. It was um, it was I got to work little kids. And then I worked that first year. I was still K mm -hmm. through six. The second year in that other school, I worked high school. It's a huge shift. The first. Um, and anybody who's yeah. worked with. Well, kids. I had 14 kids on my caseload. Yeah. I learned how to read IEPs. Yeah. I did all the stuff. You do all the things you need to do as a teacher. But I was only I was getting paid. Uh, as a teacher at that time, right? I got paid what a teacher gets paid, which is fantastic. Good for me because uh, prior to that, I did security work and I worked at a body shop uh, painting cars for almost 17 okay. years. That's a whole mm. other story for another time. Right. So uh, anyway, I'm gonna go, I switch transition to high school. My caseload goes from 15 kids uh, down to one kid. I was working in a classroom, but they assigned me to one kid. And I went from getting paid as a teacher to getting paid as a pair pro again, uh, as, an, as a, a student assistant. And the one, the particular student that I had was assigned to was prone to extreme violent outbursts and was a handful. Uh, yeah. The year before they hadn't even made it, they hadn't even made it through the first two months of school last year. And then they had to be put in an mm. alternative program. So this year they had, because of the way contracts work and that I can't, you know, I don't know all of the things, but the, at this particular time, I was assigned to one student and at the first week was wonderful. They said, hello, how you doing? Fantastic. And greet me at the door. After that, the honeymoon was over that yep. first week. Uh, after they were extremely violent, biting, mm -hmm. hitting, kicking. Karate works real time, by the way. Just want to let you know, like people think karate, oh, it's all like flash and doesn't show. Uh -uh. No, um, there was at one point uh, I got, they had grabbed a pen off of a table and tried to stab me in the face with it. So uh, it works. It disarms work. Just How long did you, know. you put up with that? It was, but I, really? I went the whole year. Wow. Uh-huh. That's impressive. Yeah. It's a special kind year. of person so, that can do that. But what... I mean, special well, something. I, you know, I, I don't. I, I, don't um, I suspect it's not that. I, I don't. I don't think it's. It's that. I, I think it's that you. Because I, I. I know people who work in this field, and I. I hear from them how difficult it is, but when I ask them, and I, and I suspect you'd have the same answer, you're just trying to help the kid. That you you come to understand what's well, going on in that kid's corner. life, and they're and everybody else has given up on them, or so many people have given up on them. Oh, for sure. And they, and they know that. That's why they act out the yeah. way they do. And they press you until they find out whether or not you're going to stick with yeah. them or not. That's the big, they'll, they keep push back. It's like, uh, huh, I don't know, testing the resilience of a balloon, right? You keep blowing it up till it pops. And if it doesn't pop, then cool. You got yeah. a great balloon. Let's use but eventually that example. it will it's pop. It's the same thing. They, somebody that wants to, put, yeah, they push on you. Well, uh, I'm like, well, I'm made of tougher mm -hmm. stuff than that. So they, like one time they're kicking me in the shin. And they lost, 
their toenail. They kicked me so hard in the shin, they lost their toenail. Hmm. And I said, you can kick me all you want. You do realize that I get kicked all day long. Like, that's my job outside of this. Like, the, I, I, I said, after we did, I said, did you get anything out of that? And they said, well, not really, but you should just leave. Like, that kind of stuff. They're, you know, giving me the, the sass and attitude. And I said, but you didn't get anything out of it. You just kicked me. You, you know, you, and, and all you did was get hurt. It doesn't do you any good. I get kicked by uh, people in our studio the, every all day long, every day. And especially in the shins, because now we have little kids and they kick you and that's all they can reach. <laughs> but anyway, so we had these little tips going back and forth. And I, got, I went to, through some training called CPI training and the schools, they provide that for you for students that are unruly. It's OK. It does its job. But there's massive holes because of legal mm. issues. There's things you can't kind of can't do. Of course, we, the main job is to keep the kids safe. But it doesn't necessarily always keep the teacher safe. Do you, yeah. Right? It does. It does the best it yeah. can. But there's yeah. But anyway, I mean, I mean, I never, I never lost an eyeball or anything. It's good. So that was cool. All right. Got to got to Christmas. Came back from Christmas break, and this eleventh um, grader comes up to me, and the and the the student I've been working with for three months comes up to me and says, "Mr. Musoff, how you doing today?" So I'm doing great. How was your vacation? My vacation was wonderful. I said, you all right? <laughs> like that, you all right? You good? And they're like, no, I'm great. I said, you seem like you're in a fantastic mood. They said, it must be a Christmas miracle. Like, the, that's the words right out of their mouth, right? So I go, I talk to my supervisor and, and we have a chat and they had shifted some things around in that student's personal life some things around uh, medication wise, and they were able to mm. get it together. So I, I didn't have a single problem with that oh, student awesome. the rest of the year. Right. And it, it, oh, it's so, it, it was fan. It was fantastic. It was so good that I had, didn't have to put the stress on just that student and focus on just that student. Uh, they put mm. two more kids on my caseload, but I didn't get, uh, I wasn't getting the pay I wanted. Um, even though I was relieved that that was not uh, going to be an issue anymore, that, you know, um, feeling like I had to be like in orange, you know, in my, the, in, in the self-defense yeah. uh, dichotomy of that or the uh, levels of that. I didn't have to be in orange and on, on the ready all the time, but uh, it just, I, I think it kind of burned me out. For sure. I can of see public that. education. Yeah. Um, what they had me do in the last two months, because even though I had the three kids on my caseload, they were in and out mm. all the time. So I was teaching in different classes in the junior high class. I was, cause I still had my sub mm -hmm. license, right. From the other school. And it, all they got, all you got to do is resign some paperwork. You don't have to do anything else. So I, um, I taught in a junior high, taught high school, did gym class. The gym class loved me because that's easy, right? You should say that's what I do every day. Uh, and then I even took some coconuts in and broke some coconuts for the students. They thought that was pretty nice. fantastic. I uh, tried to get some of the teachers involved in some self-defense stuff that we do here because we do uh, pre-family uh, self-defense classes, and they were receptive to it. But then when they're like, well, I got to drive from Flint to where I'm at, which is, uh, it's not, it's 20 miles away, but it's not that hard. You know, it, it to me, I'm not that big a deal to them. It is, I guess. Everybody mm -hmm. has their own struggles. So anyway, well, I don't know how many times you get when you ask somebody, you want to come to a martial arts class? And they say, yeah, sure. That'd be so great. And then you never hear from them again. Often. It happens I think all the we time. all hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I decided that wasn't for me. Uh, I, took, I, I had my summer, um, was in full swing last year. And in I said, cool, I got summer off because they um, your contract goes for 12 months, but they pay you for 10 and then they save mm -hmm. some money back and then they pay for those two months. So you're really working that whole year because you're on, like if they need something over the summer, mm -hmm. they can get a hold of you but that's because you're still on their contract you know people say teachers get the summer off they they don't really even pair pros but um that being said one of my students here at the dojo uh her and her husband own a glass company in mm. town and they do windshields and stuff and uh, she knew uh her name is ellen burgess wonderful lady um she knew that uh, i had done body work for years and years uh painting cars and pumping them doing that kind of thing so thought that would be an easy transition and knew that i wasn't sure at the time i was on the fence i wasn't sure if i was going to go back mm. to teaching 
but it, uh, I got into the doing the glass work and it, it fit my schedule. I could get out at four so I could open up classes here. Uh, it was, it was good physical labor. So I, I knew that it was less stress and I could just get the job done. And, you know, accidents happen and you're going to have challenges anywhere, but it was, it was more on a personal level and teaching all day and then teaching at the dojo. I'm already making 2,500 decisions tough. from the hours of 745 to 330. And then now I got to make another 2,500 decisions from about 430 to 830. And it was, I was dealing with it, but I, I noticed that both areas mm. were suffering. You know, like I wasn't the teacher I could be in both parts. So I had to focus on one. And of course, I'm going to pick the dojo. Of course. And so now that you've yeah. got this, what, what seems to be a, a, a really good balance, you know, you mentioned proximity between, you know, one across the street from the other and everything. What, what have your students noticed in how you show up as an instructor? Mm, uh, more energy in class. You know, just a, a, a better, I would say not, not that I had a poor attitude, but I, I can get them more uplifted during a class. You know how sometimes, you know, there's a lull sometimes and you have certain students that come in and they're not like Eeyore, but you can just tell they've had a mopey day. And if, if they, if a student like that can drag the classroom down, can you imagine if the teacher's that I've way? Been in, I've been in classes <laughs> like that. So, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's just like, okay. yeah. And, and it, and it did it. It was some days, uh, some days I told, you know, like, after class teacher, students will share stuff with me and you'll, you'll have a coffee with them and stuff. And they, and so a student would say, man, you know, sometimes it's so hard for me to get here. And I, and I said, well, over the years, uh, I've run this place for 10 years, well, eight years by myself. I took a partner two years ago. I run it eight years at the time, eight years by myself. And if I didn't own this place, there's times I probably wouldn't mm -hmm. be here either because it wears you out. You it get does. wore out, but, but that's five minutes before you come in the door, right? When you walk after five minutes after you walk in the door, you remember why you want to be here. You know, that's, and I don't know if most teachers are, will admit that, but that's exactly it happens. They to seem all of us, to. Right? They seem to. I mean, we, we we certainly do get some who come on the show and they talk about how, you know, ev everything for them is martial arts. You know, what they'll train for hours before they even go to their school and everything, and and that's great. And if that's you know if that's somebody if that's you out there in the audience, that's awesome. I am jealous of you. That's not how I'm built, Paul. It doesn't sound like that's how you're built, right? Like there's there's life. Life gets in there, and and you know I I, I think right. for someone like you and I, it shows how martial arts becomes part of the tool set to dealing with life because sometimes life isn't great, right? You have those days, and and uh, I don't I don't. I don't want it today, but I've made this commitment. I've made this obligation. I'm going to be there. And you make it the best you can, maybe not for, for you, but for your students. And then it becomes better for you, right? Like I have a, I have a routine yeah. before I, I teach that to, to put down what's outside and, and, you know, just so I can give them my best. Yeah. Right. And that's hard. That can be hard. It's hard for students. Cause I see them come in, you know, but when we bow at the door, that's, we're supposed to let that go, right? That's the one thing, right? right. And, and some schools, uh, traditional karate schools, they'll do, they'll sit in Seiza and they'll do Makso mm -hmm. and they'll have that moment of breathing and then they'll start class. So we don't always do that. I, um, my school here, so my teacher, I have a picture up on the wall. Uh, yeah, see, so yeah, he's up he's there up, somewhere. Yeah. He's on the core court. Um, I, yeah. I, um, the school was founded in 1993, right? I don't know if you know any background of that. So I, I know a little bit, but the audience doesn't. Karate so, was founded in, you know, pretend we know nothing. Oh, okay. So we were, right, all right. So we know nothing. Start right there. The, this dojo was founded in 1993 by uh, Robert Lee Sensei and uh, his, his uh, partner, Sandy. And I wasn't around back then, but uh, they founded the school and they just wanted to teach traditional karate, but it was really kind of semi-traditional. It was a Shotokan school, but they, at the time they went to competitions and then he stopped doing that around 2000. Mm -hmm. So it was seven years there where he did, they did competitions, 2001, maybe. Uh, he said that um, uh, September 11th kind of changed mm -hmm. how he had to teach and how he, because there was some things there. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, I wasn't around for that. But anyways, he revamped how he wanted to do it. 
uh, he ended up teaching, you know, we've had, we can have about a maximum of 50 students at the school. We're not very big. I don't know if you've seen any of my videos, uh, um, but we're a pretty, pretty mm -hmm. small school, but we get, it's nice, right? That, that, that cool. it's small. I don't know if I would want to teach a, a big stadium full of students, like some of these schools that have hundreds of students and, uh, and how you said that sometimes schools, that's all they do is karate. I think, is there a correlation between them just being, not that I'm not a full-time school owner, because I do, we do five, six days a week, but someone that has the, that their dojo makes enough funding where they can just do that. And it's a, not it's do a different else, experience right? and I'm not, and I have a day job because I have to. It's a different experience yeah. for sure. I, I think, I think maybe that's part of it. Yeah. So what my. Um, so my sensei ran the dojo for a long, long time. Um, and the day I started was in uh, November of 2006. So it's not that long. I was 26 years old. I had, uh, I had quit smoking cigarettes and I wanted something to do with the 40 bucks a week that I was going to save. Right. So I was spending, right. And that was it. And I know that's not, uh, like, well, we got people cause I'm a mm -hmm. school owner and, a Eight, doing been doing martial arts for 18 years but my big my journey started with i just quit smoking this is this is um, a first at least and I for the show right we get we you can imagine the, the had, origin stories but th yeah. this is this is one that's i yeah. don't think we've heard before so not keep going. not really i mean i like the ninja turtles and stuff and uh power rangers because that was like the early i was 13 when power rangers yeah. came out so that would have been pretty cool green ranger he's he's bomb uh, but that's but, not when but you I, started. Yeah, you know, watch Bloodsport and all that. No, that's not when I started. And I did. I mean, I always liked martial arts as far as the appeal of it. But I had a job since I was thirteen. A whole another job because I, I have seven mm. sisters. I'm now I'm gonna now I'm gonna ramble. I'm the oldest out of eight kids, so I guess wrangling a group of people is my that's my genre, right? Is dealing with classroom leadership yeah. and uh, classroom management. It's just I've been doing that since I was thirteen. Uh, and younger probably you have a giant mm. brood that's a lot of kids but uh so I, I quit smoking cigarettes and i had this money and i wanted to get uh healthy and i wasn't really a sports guy you know i didn't want to play squash or golf or something and my I, um the, my partner at the time she had a nephew that was taking mm. karate in a town over and he, and he said, Hey, uh, uh, Hey Paul, there's, I'm taking karate at this dojo. I said, if you want to come try it, you can try it. So I'm like, cool. Uh, so I talked to my partner. I said, Hey, is this something we can work out? It's only, uh, at the time it was 50 bucks a month. And, uh, I was like, well, Hey, that's That's well within my range of $40. Yes. Right. So a week. So I said, I can afford that. Plus we got extra. And she said, that's fine. Do whatever you want. So I'm like, okay. And my goal was just to take classes long enough to be able to kick high enough to kick people in the head. Not that I was going to run around and just kick people in the head randomly, but I wanted to have the skill set that if somebody, and again, that's, I just want to say, Hey, if I had to, I'm going to mm -hmm. kick somebody in the head. So all of that, <laughs> I, uh, I try my first class and at the very end of class, I said, Hey, so when do we get to learn to kick high? Right. Because my first, because I had, I was on an uncoordinated mm -hmm. mess, right? Like we all are. Uh, my first class, my teacher pushed on my shoulder, and my job was to connect my hip and shoulder, not lead, not le lead my shoulder, but to connect one piece, so that I could do, so we could do gakuzuki reverse punch and have sure. a hip generate the power instead of thinking sure. upper body. At the time, I'm just like, what am I even doing? Like, what it, what is it? But I'm along for the ride. I didn't, I know that. The end of class, I talked to one of the instructors. His name is Kerry Schultz. And I said, so when do we get to learn to kick people in the head? Exactly like a little kid would ask. And he said, I can, I can do that right now. I can show you right now. He says, he says, stand right there. Get into the fighting stance we were working. I'm like, cool. I got it. I'm, I'm got it. I'm in my fighting stance. And he took his lead leg and he swept my front leg. And, and when I got down on my knee, he grabbed my hair and put his uh, top of his foot right on my forehead. And, and he said, that's how you do that. I don't have to reach you. I can put you where I can go. And I thought, well, that's cool. So then I really mm -hmm. fell in love with it. So later on, what end, uh, as I was testing for black belt, uh, by the way. So 
Terry Schultz was a big deal at our dojo. He, uh, he passed away just before I earned my black belt. Um, yeah, it, um, he, he came in, uh, and then he left for a little while and came back when I got about two, mm-hmm. five. So halfway to black belt. <clears throat> and I had done that for a couple of years. Oh, cool. Mr. Schultz, it's great to see you. And he brought, he brought his son, uh, Joe. And they were doing weapons classes. He said, because Joe Schultz uh, and Terry Schultz were both doing mm-hmm. Shinkendo. And they were, uh, at that, that's where they had been. Uh, they hadn't been coming to the, do- the dojo, so they'd been going to do Shinkendo. And uh, they had asked Sensei Lee if I could participate in the weapons classes. At the time, the, he, that's not something you do. You don't do that until brown belt. Because you don't even know your body enough to, at least from what their, their standpoint was, you don't even know yourself enough to, until that point to control yourself yeah. for have weapons. Yeah. Let's just stick with the empty hand stuff. Um, and, you know, and I'm thinking like, okay, cool. But they started me with short sticks and then we moved to bow and then we moved to sword and then weapons were a whole nother thing that was just fantastic. Um, <clears throat> and then, but meeting Joe was a big deal because we ended up being training partners all the way to black belt and beyond, which was, it's, it's cool to have a friend to mm-hmm. push you by the way, because you, you can feed oh, off each absolutely. other and get better. Uh, and, and at the time, I'm not even thinking black belt. Like, I didn't even care. Like, again, I'm still just trying to learn, not kick somebody in the head, but I just want, now I just want to learn as much as I can. And the goal still isn't black belt. It's just, I want to keep showing up. I just want mm-hmm. to keep showing up. Because even though I'm not great at it, I know that if I keep going, uh, I might figure this and out. And you're eventually. enjoying it. That's, that's what's coming through, so, too, is that this was something that maybe fairly quickly, it wasn't just about getting off the couch but it was something you found you had an affinity for oh dude i i can't say that i was a wonderful martial artist or i'm still worth anything i had a natural aptitude but i do have a natural aptitude to Mm. not quit like i don't know how to quit like except the only thing i quit was smoking cigarettes but i think i just really what i ended up doing was trading a negative uh habit Mm. for a positive one plenty of people do that because I, because I, I fell into it, and I'm, I'm like, I just, uh, I, I read everything I could. I uh, trained whenever I could off, off site because you can go to at the time you can go two days a week, and then uh, there was no weekend class. But after Joe started coming, he, uh, Sensei Lee said, "Hey, you guys want to come in on the weekends? You guys can have some mat time. I'll just unlock it because I'm just down the street. I'll unlock it." So, so that was cool. And then so I started after that. After Joe started training, I was like, "How long will it take to reach black belt?" Well, not that I care. Because that wasn't the goal, but now I'm like, okay, I'm halfway there. Where, where do we stand? And uh, he said, well, normally it takes anywhere between five and seven years to earn black belt. There, are people that can do it in four. I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm about two and a half years in. I'm good. Well, I started uh, going to every class I possibly could, training on the weekends, going to Carrie's house, uh, and then when I made it to red belt, you can go into the advanced class. So which that's like coup mm-hmm. three. And um, we, so I got into that and then we started, I was, um, work, I got out at five. I would go from right from work to here from 5.30 to 6.30, 6.30 to 7.30. And then I, so I did two hour blocks. And my partner at the time was like, so you're, um, make sure you take mm-hmm. time for yourself. So I'm like, okay, I, I, I didn't. I, <laughs> I ended up uh, just training more. Like I, I, I was really like, I don't know what it was. And it wasn't the goal of black belt that was pushing me, but it was just the fact that I wanted to know as much as I could that, that thirst for getting, you, I can't, I couldn't kick high enough. I couldn't punch hard enough. Like I couldn't know enough. So, uh, you know, and then the belts kept passing. I kept training with Joe, kept training on the weekends. Uh, not, and then by the time, I earned uh, advanced brown belt, which coup one, like one step away from black belt. Um, I was helping in classes. I was able to, uh, sensei would, he just treats you like a black belt by then anyway. He's like, okay, so I'm going to, those leadership stuff you can do. Uh, if I'm teaching a kata, uh, you can help by shadowing me. You know, there's things, there's things you can do. And it ha- actually helps you mm-hmm. transition into black belt. Cool. All right. So I did all that. And then um, we, I was able to, like, to sit in on some black belt classes, weapons classes, all that stuff. And before I knew it, I'm ready to test for black belt. And it's only been three years and two months. So, and I was like, 
I didn't even think about it like that. And late, just because he had said it takes about five years. And I didn't know that that was the average. Like when you go look online, it didn't occur to me to mm. look at that stuff. You know, I was, uh, I was on an island onto myself when it came to martial arts. But once I earned my black belt, I kind of looked outside of the, of what I was learning and which it's encouraged anyway, sure. because once you're in your black belt, you know how to learn, right? You've learned how to learn. Now you can go learn. Right. Um, I, I like, uh, I like to take black belt, like it's getting your high school mm. diploma. Right. When, once you're in your, your showdown anyway, when you're in your showdown, now you can go really, you know, I, 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 I agree yeah. to that. You know, I heard, I read that once. Yeah. Once you're in your black belt, it's like, um, now you can go learn real martial arts, right. Or real karate. And I, I don't know if I would say it like that, but I would say that you can, now you can broaden your horizons and you, you're more apt to take things in from other sources. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you started so you looking around learn, and learn from it, it, what the other options were. Yes. Yeah. At the same time training okay. here. So I, and I earned my knee down through this dojo and Sandan through this dojo and Yondan mm -hmm. through this dojo just recently. Um, which I didn't, I didn't present that to myself. I actually went down to Florida where, cause I told you I had run this school right. for 10 years. My sensei retired in 2014. And at the time it was going to be a group of black belts that were going to run the school, but you know how life do, goes, right? Some people go off to college. Some people move away. Some people, you know, some people are like, well, that's a lot of work. The best laid plans. I don't know yeah, about I've that. I've seen so many schools so, that think they're going to yeah, transition I mean, that way and they never do. Oh, dude. I thought it would be great. Right. And so I did what I could to learn about business stuff, but uh, I might have a black belt in martial arts, but I don't have a black belt in business. I, again, it's just starting. It is a rare deal. school that has. Since I did help. Oh Lord. He didn't, he didn't leave me with nothing. Like he helped a lot, a lot. One, he said, here, here's the school. Right. And he's like, I'm either going to lock the doors or somebody's going to take it over. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but that's kind of it. Right. Cause he, he had to retire. He was, he was, uh, he had his life to live. So, which is cool. Uh, and he, and he was a resource after that. And he's still a resource. Wonderful man. Uh, taught me, uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, I've gone now, I had a very unique experience cause he had a bunch of experience, uh, in the sixties and seventies, he trained in a lot mm. of different martial arts. He did tiger style, Kung Fu, Taekwondo, Tung Sudo, um, Aikido and Shotokan Karate. And he put them kind of mm. all together when we do our self-defense stuff. He was like doing locks and we were doing throws and we were doing in close fighting nice. stuff and we were doing elbows and knees and uh, groundwork and all kinds of, you know, shoot fighting stuff. Just anything he wanted to do for self-defense. It's what we did. I didn't know until way later, like we had a fourth degree black belt from Shota, from the Shotokan uh, FSKA mm -hmm. come in uh, maybe 10 years ago. He's like, that's, this is no, this is not Shotokan. Like I know Shotokan. I'm like, well, this is all I know, buddy. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you. Uh, so when people go like, well, Shotokan doesn't do this and Shotokan doesn't do that. I'm the first to raise my hand. I'm like, yes, it does. Right. It doesn't do, uh, it doesn't do trapping and neck cranks and, and all these other stuff. It doesn't impl implement weapons. I'm like, yes, it does. But that was just from my perspective. Right. And that, and I didn't realize till way later that that's not the majority. So, uh, really thankful that he was able to put all that together. We had a really, really unique experience when it comes to martial arts. Uh, which made it a lot easier to transition to these other ones. So um, when I took over the dojo in 2014, I was looking for education to further my education, but at the same time, learn how to run a business. Cause I mean, what, what the heck do I know? Right. Uh, I thought it, it's, I didn't think it was as easy as just keeping the door open. I knew that, but um, I, since I said, you're going to meet a lot of people that are going to come through the door, the, the best part, about that, about teaching, is that you're going to meet people from all walks of life. Yeah. Uh, do do right by them, and treat everyone the same. Those were the, those were what we're supposed to do. So, and which I I'm like, well, that sounds wonderful. I, I don't. It, that sounds all sage advice and everything. So we've been, um, and I didn't know exactly what he meant by that. But as I've over the years, I I come to realize what he's talking about when it comes to people that are coming from broken homes, people that are coming from um, impoverished situations, people, uh, doctors, lawyers. I mean, we teach, we, I've taught everybody in 10 years. I've taught uh, minorities, uh, majorities, doctors, lawyers, military people, Marines come through here. Um, 
active active military even um we had air force we had an air force girl come in here for a while we had somebody getting ready for the marines that we we had built pugil sticks for and and research basic training and got them ready for it like that's all they wanted to do so uh we and they didn't want to learn karate they just wanted the self-defense portion because they want they wanted to feel comfortable and ready so we did we took saturdays off and did that that's really cool um aren't a lot of environments where you can which say isn't, everyone gets to show as they are right that's just one of the things yeah, i love about yeah. martial arts um yeah oh dude it's so great and and so and again, that's the part that like I'm, I fell in love with again, you know, because you re you re fall in love with it for different reasons. I don't know if, if that's everyone's experience, but that's been mine. If you hang around right? long enough, I think you um, have to. The yeah, the, re, it, the reason it, you join can't it, be the reason it, that you stay forever. It just doesn't work that way. No, no, you have to change it. Yeah, it is like sweet and sour chicken. So like, there's some sweet parts and there's some sour mm. parts, right? And not to use that as an analogy, but that's the first thing I could think of. Come on. Uh, there's good and bad in running a school. There's good and bad in being a teacher. There's good and bad in your mm-hmm. own training, right? It's a, it is a dichotomy of that. Um, and you, it's easy to let the hard parts wear you down, right? So COVID was a, it was awful. Like I couldn't teach for eight months. So I went and taught in people's garages. I went and taught um, mm-hmm. at the park because we were able to do that with social distancing. But I could, I, and I, and I got to pay rent at a, at a dojo that I can't even use, right? Luckily, I have a landlord that was like nice enough to work with me. You know? And I know they were so, well, you can't, they can't, they couldn't force you out at that time, but you still got to mm-hmm. make the money to pay them back, right? And uh, we, I, um, here, again, because I don't run it on the mindset of I'm trying to take a paycheck out of it, I don't have to worry about making an exorbitant amount of money, but I have to make enough to pay the bills. Gotta, so we have still a good can't go into the hole. Train it. Right, right. So that's a worry, but but it, it it makes it okay to come into a classroom and to watch a white belt learn how to do mm-hmm. a front kick. To watch somebody who's been struggling with something for six months figure it out. For somebody that has, has a bad day and then they're all mopey and they come into class and they're sitting on the floor and within 15 minutes they're smiling and their sweat dripping down their face while they're working their butt off. Right. And those parts are the best parts, right? Uh, if you can bottle that and just have a sip of that every day, not the sweat part, but just the, the feelings. <laughs> I'm, right? I'm with you. It is the best uh, part of my week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's wonderful. And it keeps me coming back. Right? But uh, I'm getting off there, there is no, the, so, the topic is you. There is no off I, topic here. It's, it's whatever. whatever. It's what we do. Yeah. So five years, about five, four or five years in, um, one of my students, it'll be my first, my first black belt that I'll ever promote uh, through through me running the school. His name is Eric Christensen. He'll be, uh, he's going up for black belt, which is, gosh, we're going on 10 awesome. years now. But he, he's been in and out. But he was, he's a second degree, no, third degree now, uh, black belt in Hakuru mm-hmm. Jiu-Jitsu. And he's got probably five or six years experience in Wing Chun and uh, Latosa Escrima and a couple different arts. But he's been training since he was really young. He's loved it his whole life. He just, he found there was a deficiency in his mm. grappling. And Hakaru, there's two parts to Hakaru. There's ground fighting, but there's also stand-up stuff that kind that looks like Oki, uh, Aikido, but really <laughs> mean, vicious Aikido. It was the best Probably way I Aikido. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not, not, it is, it's mean, like mean it. Aikido. Um, so, so he said, I, I can do ground, I can do a little bit of ground stuff because that's what we work in, but I, I need some striking element. And even though he had done a little bit of Wing Chun with his teacher, um, he he wanted to do so. He found karate. So he, see, he started coming in. And uh, he got me hooked up with his teacher. So I started learning Hakaru. Nice. Um, so I'll be doing my... So uh, still yeah, cross training. I'm up to earn my Shodan. Yep. In Shodan in that, I have a degree. In, my first degree, it's not a Shodan. It's not an instructor degree. But it's a, a degree of learning in Wing Chun from the U.S. Wing Chun Association. So I, I have the first degree in that. And I have a probationary degree in Latosa Escrima. So I'm, which I, so nice. I can teach that. Uh, it's not not a guru license, but I'm, I have an instructor certificate. So you're, so and I, I, all going. that, no, all that's to add into the classroom. Like I had had weapons training. My teacher did weapons training, but I wanted to have a different system under my belt too for that. 
and and Latosa Screamo, if you're not familiar with that, is pretty great. It's straightforward and it's just as much power, balance, and um, assertiveness as you can put into your martial art. That's what Latosa Screamo is. And it, that and that went well with my karate because that was what Sensei taught us anyway. You be assertive without aggression and uh, don't be you be as efficient as mm-hmm. possible. And so those are things that like, they're kind of open ended thoughts. And whatever that means to you, but you can put it in a lot of. You can be very violent without the uncouthness, mm. if you want to call it that. You have to you have to ride the line of it, you know, without being a total, like uh, not like a Matt Bodie, but you have but you have to learn how to be assertive, which is hard for a lot of people. Okay. So I'm with you. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe not. And people have different yeah. things that they want out of cry. What what, what I what I'm hearing here that's interesting to me is is this, um, you know, you were raised in an environment that wasn't, I'm going to say, super rigid, right? That your instructor had these other things that they that he raised you with, and and you've continued that self exposure of what are these other things that I can expose myself to, bring back, make myself a better instructor give my students more. And, and I think that that's really interesting. We, as, as someone who exists on the internet, you know, we, we certainly have seen that there are those who push back against that for, for a variety of reasons. And I don't think we have to get into the reasons. Have you ever doubted that being so versatile was an asset? No, um, I can see why there is an allure to want to keep tradition for tradition's sake, but without a proper reason to keep it as a tradition, it's just paying homage to something that doesn't do us any good, right? It has to have a reason. So, um, it, so what we say in this school, and because we're we're going to change how we have to, if someone came in tomorrow and showed a better way to punch that i have the best way in the world to punch or i have the best way in the world to kick or whatever the technique might be guess what we're doing on thursday you're doing that you're making that change right we're going to do what they what they showed and if they can prove it right it's got to be it's got to be applicable so um, i'm um it's that's important for us so we don't stay stagnant because you can be married to the idea that something is just the way it is and there are principles that we can follow. But I, th- I think that's the difference between a technique-based art and a principle-based mm. art. So, so a technique-based art would be something where you collect a bunch of techniques or, you know, I do A, mm-hmm. they do B, right? Or, or uh, if, are you familiar with one-steps? Okay, so you have these patterns for one steps that some are great, some are not so great, some are applicable to the street, some are not. You know, some are some are totally mm-hmm. worthless for for the application of martial application, but to learn a certain skill, they they have value. Yeah. Okay, but you could collect a million things to do inside of your one steps, but now you're bound by those one steps, right? Because that's how that's the learning. Uh, module that you learn. You you have to step. When they punch right, I have to step left and all that stuff. If you learn the principles that guide those techniques, now you can just learn the principles and then you can take any technique out of those principles, whatever you need, right? It, so a technique-based art is limiting. And I think traditional martial arts, they uh, they lay into and they find comfort in technique based mm-hmm. training because it's mm-hmm. safe right principle based arts we don't always get to be the best right do you, mm-hmm. do you know what i'm saying uh, especially as a teacher or a high ranking student the last thing you want to do is have a white belt punch in the mouth right because you're like well cuz you it's, it's going to happen anyway as a teacher i feel like that's my job to get hit it's my job to get hit and I, and i want you to hit me a lot in fact uh, the last testing i got busted in the eye uh, by a yellow belt. I'm like, yes. Like I'm really, I, I go, good job. Cause you did exactly what you're supposed to do. And then, uh, and they, they felt bad about it, but anyway, but if you have a principle based art, 
those guiding principles can give you a thousand techniques instead of just one technique, right? And then you're not bound by that. And I do, I do think that some schools that too much tradition can breed that technique-based training for the sake of safety and for the sake of looking good. There are times... Now, that's just my... I, I'm, I'm with you. There are times when my, my students my, will ask me, you know, we're doing something and, and I intentionally don't get super specific on how I want them to do some aspect of it. And they'll say, well, do we do, we do it like this or do we do it like that? And I'll say something that used to drive all of us nuts as students when I was coming up. Yes. Well, but but yep. which one's right? Absolutely. They're both right depending on the context. And our job right now is to drill this enough that you start to see, oh, okay, maybe if this happens, I want to go in this direction. If this happens, I want to go in that direction. For For some people, they thrive on that principle side. For some people, they want to know if this, then that. And you know what? That only takes you so far because the world doesn't work that way. Yes. No. It is important yes. though, because I've noticed that I have some students that that's how that is. You have brought that up. That is mm -hmm. how they learn. They have to have A equals B equals C or A plus B equals C, however you want to. Um, and I, I don't mind teaching that way. In fact, I have to lean into some of that. But it also, I always tell the students, hey, this is, this is a module to get you to be able to branch out mm -hmm. and do it yourself. Like um, uh, my sensei was always, he said, I'm not a technique collector. You know, as we got up to at Pass Black Belt, he said, I'm going to show you some things. And he didn't use the words principle-based art or principle-based training, but he showed it in his actions. He said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to teach you a million techniques that you're going to, to uh, memorize and, pr and produce. Then you're just a robot. You're a karate robot. I don't want that. I want you just to be you for you in order for you to be yourself and to um, express what this karate means to you. You have to have an open ended process. Right. So which I thought was very interesting. Um, and that, that that type of training has led me to meet and being open minded. If I should say I'm thankful for that because he gave me that. Now I get to meet people like uh, Sensei Paul and Michelle mm -hmm. Enfield. Uh, the, from their uh, Gojuru out in California. I've went and studied with them as Uchi Deshi nice. for a while. And uh, wonderful. And the, and I found out Goju has principles that Shotokan share, like, you know, styles of karate, they branch off. No, my karate doesn't look like your karate. And no, okay, but it karate is all karate. It is, but it isn't. But there are some stuff where Shotokan and Goju are there, there's, very, There's very a lot similar. more in common. And then there's some that are very, yeah. very different. Shotokan's like somebody took karate and wrote it on a rubber band and then stretched it way out so you could almost read it. Do you, do you, and, then, and I want to say in general, I, mainstream I, I'm, Shotokan. I'm chewing on that metaphor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can think yeah. about it. Well, look at what I always like. Shotokan's the Texas of karate. Everything's bigger. <laughs> all the stances are bigger. That, that one um, I get. All the punches are bigger. The key eyes are bigger. Um, so, but anyways. So it got me to, I got to look into other stuff like Makiwara. Uh, I, my teacher didn't teach Makiwara, uh, but I found out through um, uh, Sensei Paul, he, or Sensei Enfield, if you use proper terminology. But, um, Noah, I had, you had mentioned Noah Lego. Noah's been on the he, show. Uh, he, I said, hey, Noah, do you know anything about, ma about Makiwara? He's like, well, I'm okay. I know of it. You know, I've trained with it. So, but if you want some good education on it, there's a guy, his name is Paul Enfield. He lives out in California. So I'm like, he's like, go talk to that guy. So I'm like, all right, sweet. So I hop on the internet I get on Facebook Messenger and I message him. I was like, hey, Paul, um, how you doing, uh, Mr. Enfield? Because I don't know. I don't know what he does or anything. Because he just says, learn Makiwara. Or go ask him about Makiwara. Didn't know he was a Goju teacher. Didn't know he did anything. I'm just like, so I got told, my friend told me to talk to you about Makiwara. Do you know anything about it? He's like, well, I know a little bit. I'm like, what? Okay, cool. So we get to talking. And he said, I actually, I have a DVD that I just put out to instruct people that don't have teachers that teach Makiwara. It's the most comprehensive thing on Makiwara. Uh, if you want to, I'm not a seller of myself, but hey, you can try it out. So um, we share correspondence. I get um, halfway decent at it. I buy the DVD and it, dude, how he laid it out, the way, it, it's fantastic if you haven't checked it out, by the way. Not that this is a plug for that, but it was so in-depth and so educational that I was able to take that information 
and from halfway across the country learn how to hit the makiwara, nice. right? Properly, not hurt myself, not do nothing. So if anybody says virtual education isn't any good, one, COVID told us different uh, if you have the right mm-hmm. educator back. Two, it's got to be the right person on both ends. Mm-hmm. Okay, if that makes sense. So, so I learned how to hit makiwara. Now I just, I started posting videos uh, a couple of years ago because I just wanted to get out of my shell of it. And I, I didn't want to save them on my phone anymore. Do you, you know, and I wanted something to look back on. Like, am I going to get any good at this? Because you never, you know, um, I'm always, I'm not good enough. Not in a bad way. But there's something I'm chasing and I don't That's know if the I'll get there. philosophy, right? There's always but, a thousand and one directions to improve. But I have to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Makiwara. So now I'm to the point where I just went to a seminar over the years from 2017 to today. Maybe last year, I went to a seminar with my friends in Heartland, uh, made friends of the Dogen. And I'm in Makiwara next to uh, Sensei Paul because it was the seminar they're running. And a student came by and he's just staring at me. And I'm like, what? I was just happy to work with my teacher that I never get to see. Right. So I'm, I'm, and I'm hitting Makiwara and I said, do, do you want a turn? Are you waiting for a turn? He said, no. I just like to watch when um, talented people hit Makiwara. I hope you're looking at him right? <laughs> because I, me, I don't know about that. And I had to, since uh, Paul looks at me, he's like, just take the compliment. You like, <laughs> know, I just said it. So it's a, uh, you don't realize the box that you're in or the, cause you can only see the world from the mountain you're standing on. Right. And everybody's in a different, on a different mountain. So uh, I did, I didn't realize that, Hey, maybe I'm getting pretty good at it. And you um, kind of, and that led me I, into... I think I was about to take you the direction that you're, you're going to go. Go. Oh, that led me into coconut yeah. training. Like I learned how to break yeah. coconuts, which is I found out that it goes in stages. It's boards and then it's bricks and then it's coconuts. Well, I went right to coconuts because that was the program that I was presented with. Um, and then, so I started hitting those in different ways. And there's three levels of that. You can put it on the ground. You can put it in your hand. You can hang it up. And so I'm like, well, now I got to find out if I can do it. I, you know, so... Uh, and all I wanted was to my, for my blocks mm. to be better, you know, cause I wanted my blocks to be stronger and I wanted to feel comfortable cause I didn't do uh Uday Tanren or mm-hmm. body tempering with my hands other than one steps in self-defense here. Uh, sensei would just say, well, hit as hard as you can without killing each other. Okay, cool. So, and, and, but that wasn't a system right. of training. Goju has a system right. for all of it. So I kind of got into that. And then I, and with talking to Noah and all this other stuff, uh, he was like, hey, do you want me to come out um, for a seminar, which I brought him out to 2020 for a seminar. And I, maybe a year year or two before that, maybe 2018, uh, I got into the Makiwara and then I started messing with a, this thing is called a kakie. A kakie is a, basically just a, a pole with a stick mm-hmm. tied to it. And it puts you in the position, do you know cross mm-hmm. arms position in a lot of martial arts where we cross our arms and you see it, it's prevalent in Wing Chun, but it's in a lot of Okinawan karate. And you, it's a pull, you pull on the arm, you hikite on the arm, and then you hit various parts on this pole. I built my own. I wanted to train on it. I saw people like Ryan Parker use it. People like Jerry Leverett use it, um, which I got in, got into him with, uh, friends with him with the breaking stuff. Um, Ryan Parker, I just thought he was awesome because who, um, who wouldn't you want to know a guy that can get punched in the throat and not even feel it? Um, if, if you're familiar with those guys. And then I met, uh, you know, Jonathan Kenny up in Canada, one's a, runs a wonderful dojo, met some people in Florida and out in New York. Um, but so martial arts will take you everywhere, but by the way. So I started branching out once I asked all these questions. And uh, so Noah wanted to come out here, do a, a couple classes, and then we do this um, seminar here. He starts messing around on the kakie that I built, but thought it's cool. And then not much longer after that, my brother got into videography and he said, uh, hey, um, that dummy that you're messing with, is that like a karate thing? I'm like, yeah, it's a, that's it. As far as I know, uh, from my, the information that I'm gathering, it's from karate. It was a tool in Chojin Miyagi's dojo, garden dojo, but it's just a picture. There's mm-hmm. not really written records. Um, there are There are oral traditions for it. And there are certain people like Ryan Parker and Jerry Leverett that work on it, but there's not a real system. Okay. And it was, and so I'm like, well, he says, well, can you make a system for it? 
I'm like, well, I don't know. I just do, I'm just doing what I'm doing, right? Uh, I can show you how I learned how to work on it. And what was, uh, so what ended, that ended up being a whole thing. He said, well, you got three weeks. I'm like, what? You got, you said you got three weeks. I'm like, well, that's great. Um, what do you mean? I got three weeks. Well, I just bought a camera, the same camera they shot the walking dead on. Uh, I have some people that have, that have free time in December, uh, in three weeks, hand me an outline. We're shooting this thing. I'm like, we're shooting what thing? <laughs> we're going to do an instructional video on it. it. Come on, dummy. He says, so I'm like, okay. Cause you have to know my brother. Uh, he is, he's always been involved in the martial arts. He's a army ranger. And then he got out of the army and then found, he found a love instead of a, he said, now I'm not behind a gun anymore. I'm behind a camera and I love it. So he, he, he still, still gets to shoot stuff, but now it's to preserve life. He said, which is a really cool thing. But, um, yeah, Corey James Taylor, if you don't if you don't want to look him up, he owns Flint, Michigan Films. Anyway, so we come in here for a weekend. On Saturday, I shoot the build on how to build one because I figure people need that information. And then on Sunday, we I built uh, we filmed how to um, condition yourself before you do, because you're slamming your body into a piece of wood, uh, how to wor do warm-ups on it and how to do basic combinations and then how those basic combinations transfer to a partner. They don't transfer equally. Because a kakia is a supplement. It's a it's an adjunct to partner training. But it it got me through COVID without having a partner. And it got and it gets me to where if I want to work on something, I can work on mm -hmm. angles. Uh it, and it it's it does it does its job. It's a it's a wonderful tool. I love it as much as I love working on the Maki Did you so did you, know, you, you finish that started. course? Like how did that go? Well, we we yeah. filmed it and now it's oh, okay. for sale. It took Four years for to get it edited because so it not wasn't editor, three weeks. But I, was, I put, tried my hand at it. It wasn't three weeks start to finish. It, it took yeah, a while. Right. Yep, it was three weeks start to finish. Oh, it got okay, it done. I just heard you. Um, keep keep going. Keep oh going. yeah, no, it took three years. weeks in December of twenty. Yeah, it's been four years. It sat on a shelf for about two because mm. COVID was in the middle of COVID. Couldn't find anybody to do it. My life took a bunch of different chain, turns and changes. And I'm like, well, I'll get, I'll get to it when I can find somebody mm -hmm. to edit it. And I had my friends, uh, my martial arts friends were like, they know I'm working on it. So a couple of them were like pushing me in the right direction. You just need to set a date. If you set a date, then you'll get it done. Right. So I, so I set a date and I found a friend to do it. Uh, Ron Gillespie, he's actually a part of the group, uh, the mm -hmm. INKKS. I'd love to talk about that in a moment. That's a, I'm getting to there. I'll culminate that in a minute. Um, I promise we'll get there. So we finally got the video out and it was June 1st and I've sold so far, we've sold 15 copies, but it is the only video of its kind because no one else is putting out a video. It, it is karate based, but it's, I, I built it in a way where anybody from any martial art can yeah. take the knowledge and build their own and put their martial art into the tool. It does not have to be a karate <laughs> tool. Right. Um, in fact, I got, gosh, what was it? It wasn't seven star mantis, but a guy that does um, five and five ancestor family mm -hmm. Kung Fu messaged me recently and said, Hey, I can see the uh, potential for use in my style with your tool. Yeah, I, I think with just about uh, when I get back from China, because right, yeah, yeah, right now I'm, tr I'm training in China. Uh, when I come back, I would like to get with you maybe this, because we have a lot of students that, can't work with each other anymore. There, are, some of them are advanced mm. age. Some of them just don't like the contact with another person. Some of them um, don't have access to a partner. And this will be a wonderful addition to our art. And I thought, well, wow, that's really cool because that's not what I was thinking. I just wanted to get the information out there. Yeah, you know, it's just funny because you think again. All I want to do is kick somebody in the head. Now I run a school because my teacher said, "Hey, just go do it." Um, and I, all I wanted to do was have have the information on hand so that I could share yeah. something I love. And now other people are finding a better use for it. So it, uh, I guess the lesson in that is uh, don't just get hung up on what you think it's going to be. It could be something completely different, um, which is leads me to this INKKS thing. Um, the INKKS is a nonprofit organization, um, which I'm, I'm hooked yeah, up to two we'll, nonprofits. We'll, we'll talk way. about the other one uh, once we... Yeah. Talks to this one. Um, but the INKKS is, is, was founded by Nathan Ogden and Noah Legel. They're the president and vice president. And um, of course, it's just, 
it's me and Ron, and then you um, already did, I think. Talk to Kyle. Yep, yeah, Kyle's didn't you? Right, you did. You did mm-hmm. one with Kyle. Kyle Dome. Okay, because I didn't want to speak out of turn. I thought you already did. Um, I know you did one. We did an interview yep. with Noah. Noah's I did recently. one with Kyle Dome. Um, so, hey guys. and we all just sort of met on the internet and became fast friends because that's what martial mm-hmm. arts does. It has a wonderful job. It does a wonderful job of networking and building mm-hmm. connection. Uh, if you could say anything, you know, in the turn of the century, they said karate was good for. Okay, maybe it was good for fighting, but it was good for. Uh, longevity that was what they touted it as right because people people in okinawa live forever well now we know it's because their diet and stuff but also the they could say well it's part of partially karate because now people at any age can do it uh it now i would say that karate and martial arts in general has a wonderful way of building connection which could fold back into what my teacher was saying hey you'll meet people from all types of life and i didn't think it was going to be as much as it is so anyway, now we're trying to provide a, a venue through the INKKS for anybody that doesn't have a teacher, like mine. My teacher retired. Well, I, was, uh, I was left with no way to um, advance mm-hmm. in my rank instead of going maybe going to one of these organizations, which I didn't have a lot of experience with. Uh, I, I didn't think I could go to like the JKA or the JS uh, or the FSKA or any of those, right? Because uh, I wasn't sure that because our Shotokan is so individual. It's so different than what regular mainstream Shotokan is. How would I fit in? And same with Noah. His 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 sensei passed away, so he's like, well, where do I fit in? Uh, Nathan Ogden is, uh, you know, he had his own situation, and so did Kyle, and so did Ron. You know, we've all we we found a mutual ground is, to stand on. Common and situation. We said if it happens to us, yes, if it happens to us, then I bet you there's so many other people out there. If you that train happen, long enough, it's, it's probably going to happen to you. Uh, so we're looking, you know, that's what we're trying to do, provide an environment where people can learn, people can share, people can grow without fear of stuck, stuck in a box, you know, or, or, um, we are honoring tradition without being bound by it. Right. So you're able to come from any, any direction and find a home if you need it. Right. Which I think is a wonderful, wonderful thing we're trying to do. And so far it's working out great. We had our first, uh, seminar down in Missouri this past year. Uh, just before the turn, you know, this is in 2023. It was great. Um, I learned a lot. I met I met some Kempo people down there, and they got so excited about some of the because I did some kakie drills with them, but I turned them into mm-hmm. partner work. And they thought they were thought that was so much fun that they couldn't wait to take it back to their school nice. and work on it. And then two weeks later, I get a phone call, uh, a phone video message, and she says, "Hey, look at what we've been doing in class." Because I totally forgot about it, honestly. She shows she shows me the drills they're working on. And I'm like, that's so great. I can't believe you're doing that. Um, it, it was really, really nice because you never know. I had never taught a seminar before. I mean, I taught uh, women's self-defense classes. I went I went out and taught to senior center, senior citizens groups, but I've never done anything like this. This was a totally different thing. Uh, needless to say, it worked out fantastic. Um, and we're planning on doing another uh, group training, uh, Gashaku, I'm probably going to murder that terminology. I don't know if that's no idea. Not not a a term. A a meeting of different martial arts. Yeah. Uh, It's a group of people going to train. And right now we're trying to figure out all of that. That's in the works for next week. Uh, Awesome. Yeah. So I'm, and I'm, for me, I'm going to bring uh, an MMA guy in here to train and teach, have come in here and do a seminar to teach here because I think it's important. I think we should go like, it's funny because now MMA is doing the same thing and whether it becomes its own art or not, or people think it's its own art, you know, I don't know what the qualifications are for that. There's, there's probably a good list, but I think it's a principle, an idea. And I think if it can start there, it will, it'll eventually become its own art anyway, but that's, you know, maybe speaking out of turn, but um, I think it's important uh, because they're so well-rounded in the fact that they do all this different stuff. They're like a martial art stew that uh, traditional martial arts can learn from that. Just that's that kind of what you set out to concept. do anyway, right? That, that's that's yeah. the principle-based yeah, so. versus right. the technique-based. And I think that there are a lot of us that... Yeah, so I guess like, it'd be easy to, be easy to yeah. lean into that, yeah, I guess, for, for sure. So Now, you um, mentioned a second nonprofit. I want to yeah, make sure we get there because I know this one's oh, important to you. Yeah, I can't... Probably, Probably can't see the sign. It's going to see be backwards. Kitsune Defense. Okay. Um, my, 
That's pretty cool. This is one of the cards that we did. Personal power with a, a sweet graphic on it. Yeah, is it backwards? It's probably backwards. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so my wife put all this together. Uh, she's a genius when it comes to this stuff. But she, uh, she did a marketing for uh, Harley Davidson for. Okay. Life. So she knows a bunch of different. Yeah, she did marketing and advertising. Um, and so she's she's definitely if I'm good at teaching, she's good at all the other stuff. She's I'm just good at paperwork. Baloney. She's fantastic at hitting me. Um, she actually started training. She started training martial arts before I did. She's she started when she was 11, and when she was here, she when I started, she was already a black belt here. And uh, yeah, that's that's how that's how I met, well, met my wife. But we were just friends for about 17 mm-hmm. years before we even. So I got to ask, what changed? That's she not a common talked. thing. Uh, what changed? Sir, uh, oh, yeah. why we were yeah, went from a good friends story to then, when you're willing to share partners like that. Uh, yeah, we can get into that. Okay. Then we'll get into All the right. nonprofit right. we'll she started. Up. She'll say I started it, okay. but she started it. Um, I, be- I believe. So, she, when I first started, she was a black belt. She taught me how to get into a front stance and said it was piss poor, but I'll work on it. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what she's. That's what she said. We'll get you there. Okay, cool. Um, but she, she trained for a couple of years after I started, but then her life was going in a different direction. So she took a break and then she ended up getting married and, and then her life went in a completely different direction. She ended up doing marketing and do it, working for all these other, uh, interests and all these other things. And she, but she'd always come in every once in a while. Uh, she'd say, hi, hi, Paul, how are you doing? And I always show her some cool stuff that I'm working on. I'd show her like Perry Pass drills or a new lock I learned or something or new kata. And she, she was like, Oh, that's really great. So we would just talk, you know, cause that was what, that was our, that was our mutual bonding thing that we had always done. You know, we're friends and she's my teacher and all that stuff. So, um, uh, so it was always great to see her. And so she came and went and came and went. And well, one day she, um, uh, I was in the middle of transitioning out of a relationship. And so was she. She said she wanted to come back to the dojo and just train. So she started training for a couple of months and I had ended my relationship and she had ended her relationship. And then it just sort of blossomed from there as we were training. So, um, you know, cause you always have things you talk about after, after the floor and training floor. She did, um, it's one of those things where you could talk to somebody. So you and I could sit and talk. We have a mutual, uh, thing that we can right. talk about martial arts. So that gives us common ground to, to share a conversation over a coffee. But if I was to talk to you, anything I would say verbally, you might always take with a grain of salt because you can't experience what I experience. I can't experience what you're experiencing. So we have to do the closest thing we can. So I can only know you so well from a conversation. When we're out on the floor, there's very little talking, but I can know you better, way better than a conversation. I'll know more in 10 minutes on the floor with you, what kind of person you are, how you conduct yourself in through life. And I know that sounds silly. Not to me. But it... If, if, the, if the nonverbal interactions that you have, training a while, you become they, so close with people. For sure. Well, I, so from an outside oh, observer, totally. I know that sounds Absolutely. silly. They're like, what are you talking about? But uh, I firmly believe that you learn more about someone training with them than you ever will have a conversation. So that being said, we, uh, we trained, we shared information and, and, um, she got back into the point where she felt comfortable training because she had been out for so long. Um, and she, that's where this uh, unmask your personal power mm-hmm. comes from. Um, well, part of it is when you can lose that. There's a lot of ways we can lose our personal power, you know, and, and sometimes it can be taken from us and sometimes uh, directly or indirectly. So this is, this is where the nonprofit comes in. So, yeah, so I ended up, uh, so me and my wife uh, at the time, not my wife, uh, she was getting back into training and teaching. I said, Hey, I've been doing the, I've been running the school for so long by myself. It's a lot of work. I don't want to do it by myself anymore. And you know, would you want to help me? And she, she jumped at the chance. She didn't even like say there was not even a thought. She's like, like, absolutely. So we started building the dojo, reinventing the brand of it. So we're in the process of that. But again, since I didn't really have any money in the coffers, it's kind of like a grassroots thing. still there. We're getting somewhere. 
um, cause I just had the dojo on, not to say it like this, but I had the dojo on life support, you know, just so happy that it was, it was running. Not, I didn't want, yeah. I didn't care about the growth it, it, part. Uh, I, I, yeah. I think, I didn't care about I the growth part. I think one of the, the, the big secrets, the big deep, dark secrets in our world in the martial arts industry is that so many schools are in that place, but people don't talk about it. We, well, yeah. What is it? The, the statistics are 60% are, are underwater or almost there. And 40% are sort I, of making I would be surprised inside of that 40%. It, I would be surprised if 40% are thriving. I really would. My, yeah. my guess is it's 70 and, to 80. And then we can talk about like, I would ask you, yeah, do you think it's that it, it probably is. Yeah. There's, um, and, and that goes into statistics that can be skewed too, but uh, uh, that'd be a question. That'd be a conversation that you could have uh, with your audience about uh, why that is and how that can change. Maybe that's something you could talk about later because we're still on this. Uh, Cause I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, but the, so as we're, we're building this, there was a, we had a student come in. She was a victim of a sexual assault when she was in college and she tried different martial arts to um, not feel mm -hmm. powerless. And this was back when she was 20. She tried Muay Thai and she tried a couple other things. Loved Muay Thai, but she didn't want to get, she didn't like the closeness. So she both mostly worked on the bag, did a couple of things. I hope she doesn't mind me. She probably wouldn't mind me sharing the story. So um, I'm not calling her out by name, so that is probably okay. So she stops all that. She felt, she, I mean, she was sleeping with a gun by her bedside. Like that, that afraid, afraid to go to the store, afraid, always looking over her shoulder. She started training here in 2022, if I'm not mistaken. Me and Sensei Emily had already been running classes, got our groove back, right? To where we were feeling good working together. We could run a class. I'd run one. She'd run one. You know, when you can, when you have a good partner, you can bounce off ideas and stuff. But we were feeling good. She came in and she said she didn't really want to work with people as much, but she wanted to try. So. We started working with her. We said, well, we are trauma informed or at the time we didn't even know that term, but we had worked from a standpoint of, we want you to have this, a safe place where you can grow because it's important. What do you need? Right. What do you need out of it? And we were already doing the self-defense Saturday classes where it's not, you're no gi straight up street clothes. And we deal with the things that happen. We take a martial art and we just strip it away from all of the traditional parts. And we say, what works for you right now? And what would you need for like the worst 30 seconds mm -hmm. of your life? What do you need? Right. What do you need to deescalate a situation? What do you need post? What do you need? Uh, what do you need pre when your sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system kicks off and you start uh, tunnel vision? How do you how do you get that to slow down a little bit? How do you deal with the police afterward? How do you deal with uh, all the legal ramifications from six months down the road because you um you defended yourself appropriately or inappropriately. You know, how do we, how do we deal with all of that scary mess? And how, do, how can martial arts help that? Uh, because that, that's not something because, because we feel that's what you need. Cause that's what you're telling us that you need. Do you, so, so we, we started building a program, not necessarily around her, but any student that came in on Saturday. And she said, um, she said, Hey, you know, there's other people that, can use your help. I know some people. So she got other people involved in the Saturday classes and it got really big and, and it gets big, it gets small. It does, it waxes and wanes. But it was, it's become Saturday class became a thing unto itself where it was just self-defense. And it was just what, and we talked about proximity. We talked about de-escalation. We talk about um, low level techniques or attacks or principles, right? And then we talk about what those what, what things can be simple, that what things can be direct and repeatable. You know, those are the things. And Emily and I got to talking and this student got to talking and uh, we started building a program around this thought. She said, and she said, you know, this is the first time in 20 years where I haven't slept with a loaded pistol on my nightstand. This is the first time in 20 years where I've walked to the grocery store or I've driven to the grocery store, walked to my car, put my groceries away. And I know that I've scanned the area properly. And I, I know I'm doing all the things right where I feel comfortable going by myself. And she is a prosecuting attorney that does sex crime, that prosecutes sex crime. So for someone that sees violence and deals with violence on a daily basis after the fact and went through it herself, for her to say that to us was just mind blowing because we just thought we were helping 
a friend and student, right? And then it blew up into something completely crazy. So Kitsune Defense is now, uh, we put in for the nonprofit, took us a year. Uh, we started, it actually got our official paperwork back in January. Mm -hmm. So now we are uh, the first uh, nonprofit of its kind that deals with um, victims of sexual assault and domestic violence, no matter your background, and families of domestic violence and sexual right. assault, because we know that the best way to deal, to help the person is to help the uh, the network around that person to build that up. Um, so uh, it, we're trying to give you the skills so that you can, not that you have to, would ever have to survive it again, but that you get your personal mm -hmm. power back. Because when you go through something like that, we found out through the courts, you one, one everything you ever thought about being an adult or being a child is stripped away. Your personality gets stripped away if something mm -hmm. like that happens. Uh, you are in a domestic violence situation. You aren't even yourself, right? Because no one in their right mind would stay with someone that's hurting them, right? You would think. Our self-preservation instinct would kick in. That doesn't happen. There, you know, it, it's a it is a psychological issue. There's psychological things that we need to help help with in combat. Which we, we're our, with our nonprofit, we're trying to provide uh, have a therapist we, on our because we found out that people get triggered in mm -hmm. our self defense classes. So we have we have one on call. So um, so we've got that. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Went off the tracks for a sec. But we're um, we're trying to build this up so that we can. Um, provide this for anyone that needs it. Oh yeah, back to the courts. That's what I was getting at. So if you go to the courts and you're a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, the court can uh, provide you with housing, money for housing if you need it, money for uh, a ways to get a different job, a ways to get a vehicle, uh, even ther some therapy services, but they don't provide that other support system of feeling whole because that student that I'm telling you about and the other students, they didn't have that. The martial art part didn't help because they didn't have it. Didn't even know it was a thing they could that would help them. Right? And I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm sick and tired of feeling like I'm gonna be a victim mm. or I'm worthless, right? And we know from our training that we can build that. That'll build us up mentally, right? Anybody that hasn't gone through that, we still get the feeling of I feel stronger. I feel more confident. I, I build. We build leaders anyway, right? So we just take that and then we turn it into a force for good that can help people that really, really need it and don't even know that we're here. Okay. So, um, so we're trying to get into the court system right now to be able to act, be an active participant in that so that we're one of the people that get, ca mm. get called as, hey, you, you don't have to participate in this, but this is a service. For you. This, is, this is a wonderful right. thing or, that you're doing. I think it's great. And uh, we... Uh, not to really quote that movie Robots, but you know C and E fill, fill a need. Yeah. yeah um, we're we're trying to do that, you know, because if we're not going to do it, who else is going to do it? I got sick of being, not being the people that say they're going to do stuff and not doing it. But I've always been like, if I'm going to say I'm going to do something, or I'm even going to think about saying I'm doing it, I better do it. I can't I can't talk about it. I got to be about it. Right? So uh, what good am I if right. I'm not? I have to stand on my own for that. And so my wife's like, yeah, we can do this. We can build this. I know we're running into 1030. It's all good. But she said, we can, we can build this. This will be great. Um, so we got all that stuff. And we're, we're actually into a position now where I am through the nonprofit. We've been going to local churches, doing Saturday yeah. classes after we do our Saturday class here. Uh, doing mother, we've always done mother, daughter, self-defense classes twice a year. We did them, uh, Four weeks in a row. My teacher instigated that in mm. the 90s. And we have a red man suit. We got all that stuff. Uh, and he, his was, we can't make you black belts in four classes, but we can get you the conversation mm. started. Seminars get a bad rap and, and self-defense classes like that get a bad rap because it's going to give you a false sense of security. Yeah, if you go to one. Yeah, Actually, if you go I, to two. I, I don't, I don't believe in, in that misnomer. We did a whole episode. If someone is more confident, then the psychology shows they're less likely to be a victim. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, okay. So one of the things we talk about psychologically, you carry yourself. We, we have a, you know how I said non-verbally, you can meet, yeah. you can know somebody better on the floor than we can have at a conversation. Plus, our conversation is eighty-five percent non-verbal anyway that you have with people. So, but 
that's beside the point. So we use that. That actually, there's a, a psychology study done over in the UK where they uh, filmed women walking down a hallway. Some were victims of sexual assault. Some were not. Are, are you familiar I, with that? I think I know where you're going. I know a similar yeah. one. Keep going. So they had, they had, um, they had predators watch these videos. They never saw a face. It was all just 10 or 15 seconds, maybe 30 seconds of this the people walking down the hallway away from them. They could tell within five seconds which ones were victims of sexual assault or which ones were easily uh, going to be preyed they upon. Agreed they could tell which ones would be. The criminals agreed. Which ones would be an easy meal, which ones yep. would be a hard meal. And which, that's what a predator wants. A lion doesn't want to attack the young, strong bulls or the strong kudu. They want the weak, the sick, the elderly, because they want to eat again tomorrow. They want to eat again the next day. So you got to think about why, why are they, why did they pick me? That's what, you know, and that's not a victim blaming thing, but that's what they ask. Why did they pick me? Whether or not that's true or not, but they saw something in you that they thought mm -hmm. they could get away with you, right? They're just a bad, they're in, in ultimate, in all things being considered, it's nothing to do with you. It's just that, that person was there and they're a bad person and they're evil. That's it. Okay. But what we can do as a human, if we want to be less of a victim, is set ourselves up for success. How we carry ourselves. Uh, did you did you notice, uh, like in school, were you a people watcher in school? Very much. Yeah, I was too. Uh, I didn't know this at the time, but I was a I was a big dork in school. I'll, I'll admit that. I was not a sports guy. I, I liked art and uh, I did photography and I liked history, right? And comic books and stuff. But I uh, I would watch people walk down the hallway. I would cruise through the hallway, like just try to get around people. Like kind of like the way I shop. I just move and get out of the way. But I would see some people were very confident. They had their hel chest up, their head held high, and they were walking through. And you could equate that to some people that were really good. Either they were um, extroverts or they were like captain sure. of the football team, that kind of thing. They were used to the attention for one, and they were used to portraying that. But th whether they knew it or not, they were consciously or uh, subconsciously portraying someone that isn't a victim. Because we know that people that don't want to be victims, my head's on a swivel, I'm looking up, I look like I'm not mm -hmm. an easy meal, right? I look like I can't be taken uh, off chat, off balance or taken by surprise very easily. You'd have to get me to let my guard down, and, and then, but there's our tactics that they use, right? But then there's other people where their shoulders are slumped forward. They're staring at their feet while they're walking, right? You, I, I, I know you by your shoes right. kind of guy. Okay. <clears throat> we, we do the same thing when we're walking, when we look at our phone too much. So, so you, are, you are subconsciously showing the world that you're a victim just by looking at that. you're Because you're portraying that, um, that physical embodiment of that. So, so we try to tell people not to stare at your phones and for, for mm -hmm. good reason. But that's one of the main reasons. I think that I think that's a pretty good analogy for that. So anyway, why am I why am I getting off that? Just the more confident you are, the more you hold yourself like you're confident, right? And so we so when you think, okay, self defense, do self defense classes teach that? Hmm. Some do, some don't, right? So what we wanted to do is so why we wanted to set ourselves apart with Katsune Defense was we saw that these other self defense programs when people got away from them and they, they, they ended up leaving, they were like, well, I still have questions or I still have things that didn't get addressed mm -hmm. for me. So we thought we would try to help add that, Do you, yeah. you know, and we've talked to other people, like, because we talk with law enforcement on a regular basis and we talk with lawyers, we, we try to get the legal aspects mm -hmm. of it. And we try to do study case studies and see where, where things went wrong for the victim and how, in the future, you can learn lessons from those situations. And, and some of it is just how you portray yourself in life. And some of it is, um, you know, don't go anywhere without a buddy, things like that. But we, we saw there was deficits. We th saw there was deficits in some. Because, you know, because I don't know if you've run into some of these schools, uh, but they'll say, I can do self-defense because I'm a black belt. Okay. Have there, you heard that? There is an overlap can teach between martial arts and self-defense, but they are not synonymous. Oh gosh, my wife says something awesome and I'm probably going to ruin it. She said, martial arts and self-defense are not mutually exclusive or not mutually something. God, she's so much better. I wish she was here. She's working. So 
she's more eloquent than me. Um, it's a good thing uh, she yeah, does the marketing. So, right? you, when you have a good partner, we you know where, like if I don't know, I don't know half the stuff and she knows the other half. <laughs> so if people want to learn but, uh, more about what, what, what's, what's do it all now, let's do all the links, the, the websites and the social media. Let's, let's put that out to everybody. Oh, okay. So um, the dojo itself is heyankaratedo.net or the dojo. Um, Kitsune, I'm going to have to write, make sure I get this right. Kitsunedefense.org Spell Kitsune for is uh, K-I-T-S-U-N-A or N-E, excuse me, at gmail.com. Kitsune Defense at gmail.com. That's uh, Kitsune is the, if you're not familiar with it, it's the nine-tailed oh, fox okay. from Japanese mythology. And they wear... They, it's a, they, it's portrayed as a mask in like kabuki theater and things of that nature. So my wife said, uh, like, unmask your personal power. Once you are, once it's taken away from you, you wear a mask throughout your life because you're not the, not the person you used to be. So we get to unmask that and bring you back to yourself. Anyway, nice. there's a little plug for that. And so yeah, we have continued I-N-K-K-S. defense. Um, yes, the INKKS dot. Is it EDU? Pretty sure it's org. I don't have that on my paper. <clears throat> Could be org. dot org. Yeah, that one. Um, uh, yeah, one. I'm I'm one of the founders of it, but I'm I'm just terrible at the paperwork stuff. So, uh, yeah, we'll we'll get all that stuff linked up. But in yeah, the notes well, for yeah, they're all they're really great at. Uh, they, there's so many fantastic resources mm-hmm. built up into that INKKS. Like I'll be I'll be doing a seminar July 27th for nice. the Kakia, and that's 20 bucks for most people. Anybody that's in it, it's free, um, and. The the dojo itself, we got that. We got the nonprofit. Is Social media missing for any for any of these things. Oh, I have. Um, mm, da, 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 da. It's just at Kitsune Defense, and I assume that's Instagram. Okay. Tell you what, if 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 you but want, again, my like, wife I know does... you put a few things in the in the in the form, like come up with a a full list on all this stuff. Ship it over to us, and we'll, we'll make sure we get it plugged in. Sweet, I'll totally do that. Like I said, it's not that I'm defunct with no, that it's, it's just it's, it's not, not my like, area look you you could ask me for a list of all our websites and social media and i guarantee i would miss a few things as well so no no worries oh. no shade being thrown here my friend uh in, in a minute oh, i am yeah. going to throw it back to you to close us up this has been an awesome chat oh cool but but but, but no but well, before, before we do that is there anything that you wanted to ask no. that you didn't no i i never show up to these wanting to ask anything i just show up and see where the guest wants to go and you made my job easy. I mean, the audience could probably tell. I didn't. I didn't say as much as I usually do because you just kind of went, and I just hung well, on for I the just ride. Did a bunch of word salad good talking. It's a good time, man. Yeah, that's usually what happens. My ADHD kicked in. You, you are, you are not alone. But to the audience, you know, oh, I, I hope thanks. you do check out all the stuff that Paul's got going on, and uh, and I, I hope we we sparked some thought in this episode. We we talked about a number of things that are. I think they're big subjects for contemplation and, and hopefully hmm. all of you out there take at least one of them and sit with it and really think about your training and how it relates to, again, I'm not even going to tell you which one or ones you should be thinking about. Uh, and don't forget whistlekickmarshallartsradio.com as well as whistlekick.com for all the stuff that we've got going on. But Paul, how do you want to close us up? I mean, you, you've, you've talked about a ton of different great things well, today, but uh, well, thank you, everybody that stayed this long. <laughs> and if you listen to the end, uh, you get a bonus. Uh, if you sign up for the Kakye thing, you can do it for free. Uh, by the way, though, um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. And by, if you want to participate in that, all you need is a broomstick yes. and a punching bag. Just show up because it'd be cool to see you there. Um, but but thank you for having me and uh, allowing me to just uh, uh, talk with you and not necessarily at you. Um, and in, if we did spark some questions, it's wonderful. Uh, at least just some thought, because that's what I really want to do is I want to make sure uh, my job is just to share what I love with other people and they can take with it and do with it what they want. Right. Um, and just because that's been my mo- motivating factor. Right? I just want to be able to share what I love. Because if a guy like me can do it. Well, it's a, so um, I'll tell you more. There's, there's a synopsis about like my physical things. So I can't see oh. out of this eye. Right. Yeah. And I was born two months premature and uh, a heavy smoker and all this stuff. And the last guy you'd think would be doing martial arts. So if a guy like me can do it and be halfway decent at it, 
You know, um, I hope the whole world tries it because everybody should. And I'll just leave it with that. Thank you.